week because it deals with my two favorite things, small companies and how Europe is really changing towards a more sustainable manufacturing platform through the strength of biotechnology. As we're all aware, we're sitting in interesting times, both from a climate change perspective and from a European economic perspective. As we try to move beyond COVID economically and societally, we have a big uphill battle ahead of us to make sure that industry regrows competitively and that we look at how we become more resilient and self-reliant for a lot of our different uh, products that we already make. And so this, and this goes hand in hand with the point that we're now trying to meet the great objectives of the Green Deal. So we have the simultaneous need to become and next you know, to introduce next generation competitiveness in Europe, but also meet our Green Deal targets as well. And this is where biotechnology plays a really strong role. You will already be familiar with the role of fermentation in things like bread and beer. But in fact, this is an incredibly common and broadly used technology platform that can be used to make a lot of different products, even if the final products that they go into have nothing to do with biology whatsoever. It's a method of manufacturing um, products and sort of in ingredients and intermediates and lots of different things that moves away from petro petrochemical driven processes. And so not only uses bacteria and yeast and fungi, as a sort of little engines of productivity, but it means they can also use sustainable biological resources to create the fuel for this process. It's incredibly exciting because you can make so many things this way. And we've looked at it all the way through this year and things like our anniversary for the 25th, 25th anniversary of Europa Bio, where we've looked at stories such as where vitamin B2 manufacture was transformed from 50 years of chemical production into uh, entirely biological production. And this is a huge global market of over 10 billion euros per year. And it's now almost entirely produced through uh, microbial fermentation. So you can see that you can change a lot of things that you didn't know probably are already produced through biological fermentation or have the potential to be produced through fermentation. And there's a lot of technology and entire sectors emerging to help Europe do this. And our presentation today is going to be all about meeting some of those small companies that are bringing really amazing technologies in and looking at how we make use of natural resources as best possible. So we're looking at both a combination of fermentation processes that can be used where you didn't think they were being used before, plus how we make great use of existing biological resources that we have to be to produce novel ingredients and, and things like that that can be used by end products themselves or as part of production processes. So I could talk about this pretty much all day, as you can probably tell, but I'm going to get on and introduce the speakers that we have today. This is me. You already know me, so you don't need to know me anymore. And we will move over to three really excellent speakers today. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, you are very welcome to ask questions at any point during the chat function, and we will try to answer them after the main presentation has taken place. So I'm going to go to our first presenter, who is Cyril Pourtenier from Abolis, a French SME. And so Cyril, do you want to introduce yourself and explain how Abolis is working as part of Europe's trans transformation into a biological economy? Sure. Thank you, Claire. Uh, you actually explained most of the things that our company is doing already, so I'll try to be quick. I'm Cyril Boutonnier, CEO and founder of Abolis Biotechnologies. It's a company that I founded seven years ago with especially the purpose that you described, Claire, uh, which is helping major chemical group to manufacture the compounds that they need in a completely different way using industrial biotechnology. So I'm a chemist by training. Uh, and when I realized that uh, we had to change the chemistry we were um, doing, so I switched to industrial biotechnologies and I started my company uh, in the field. Um, so just try to, um, to go a, li a little quick over the company and what it is doing. Uh, we really believe that the future would re require a much more sustainable chemistry, a, sustain a chemistry which is not only bio-based, but also, also produces molecules that is, are biodegradable. So we could have a, a very nice recycling 
not through very expensive and complex uh, industry as it is done today, but just by simply uh, making everything compostable. And uh, the proof with plastic is that uh, it is possible, uh, but in, if you speak of an entire smartphone, this is of course way more challenging. Um, so our mission is to help uh, industry, uh, by industrial company, chemical company, uh, to build in a sustainable, cost-effective and secured way the compound that they need, decrease their environmental impact and develop safe by design molecule to replace toxic product. Uh, a very simple example that I usually take for this is uh, the development of a bio-based biodegradable sunscreen that we are doing with Givaudan and AgroParisTech, and which already has the same performances as a classical organic filter, despite being totally different uh, molecule, and which do not have the problems that you can meet with the with the cheap uh, uh, industrially manufactured, uh, chemically manufactured filters that we see today. So the company is, uh, is about 40 people, it's quickly growing. We have uh, many open positions at the moment. Um, it's uh, mainly PhDs. Uh, we have 850 square meter at Genopole. So it is Genopole is in the, the biggest bio cluster south of Evry, in Evry, south of Paris. And we have uh, we've worked uh, successfully on a wide variety of molecules from different fields. Um, so how do we work? Um, when, when an industrial come to us and say, hello, Abolis, I would like to produce um, this chemical, that price, uh, and that volume, um, could you could you help us with it? We start by doing a classical engineering study, where we look at the uh, the all the what is known in the literature, uh, the intellectual property associated, and the technical economic analysis of the project. And if the business plan fly, and that we both agree that uh, it really works, investing and developing this. Uh, this new this new chemical this new ingredient we engage uh starting developing first a prototype strain and a prototype bioprocess which usually uh is uh, what we consider a prototype is usually one tenth of the final industrial performance required to have the product at cost um and then uh and if we succeed in this uh in the bio pro prototype we develop the industrial strain in the beginning of the process that would be uh, scalable and then of course it is up to the client to scale it it's himself uh, in his own factory or we could help him finding a CMO a, manuf a tool manufacturer to make the to make the compound um, so at Abolis we have uh, like six different core competences under the same roof which are uh, software we develop our own pieces of software that we are required um, of course genetic engineering and uh, strain collections uh, a robotic platform um, to help us automatize the most tedious part of the uh, of the of the cloning job uh, and ca strain characterization job a uh, very strong uh, mass spectrometry platform uh, with uh, seven instruments uh, fermentation platform uh, 10 1 liter and 120 liter with also automated fermentation robots and uh, also have intellectual property in-house uh, with one engineer on IP and, uh, and several people working around him. And we also made a, built up a special management system so that we're capable of uh, managing uh, open innovation projects with the uh, with biggest group of the world. Um, and uh, this is all centralized by our own uh, piece of software which centralize all the information uh, that we're producing, which is called Awesome Abolis Workflow Solution for Metabolic Engineering. Um, so we have uh, various programs uh, on different molecules. I, I can't name them all, uh, but basically we are already mastering. Uh, so this is all the molecules that you can make, um, like which are at hand when you when you speak of uh, of metabolic engineering, and we already have a significant experience uh, in several of the petals of this flower, and of obviously our um, our main uh, vision is try to cover each and every petal. Um, I, I have to be quick. I'm just going to give you uh, one quick example of what one thing we did for a client. Uh, the patents are public now, so we can speak about it. Um, we we uh, The client was short every year in these two molecules, which are plant extracts. Um, so what we did is that we sequenced the plant, took out the genes, reassembled the pathway, and proved that we can make in a 20 liter fermenter and purify the product um, in only 18 months. 
Um, and as you may see, it is 47 step pathway, uh, 25 uh, genes inserted and so on. So it, it really proves uh, one, by one case study what we could do for a customer. So as you said, Claire, and I, I won't spend more time on it, uh, it is uh, what we more especially biosynthesis is really becoming industrial in these days, uh, and it will certainly be part of the, of the solution for the 20th century uh, in all different fields. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Cyril. And that was a really great example just to introduce us to how you take you know, the complexity of biology and use it as your own production line. And we have examples of this in our anniversary program this year in uh, Europa Bio, where things like um, zero calorie sweeteners from Stevia, which many of you will be familiar with as they're appearing more in fizzy drinks and things like this, those are extracted from um, Stevia plants. And they're actually, it's a very inefficient process to extract them with a low productivity. And there's a high risk that the, the demand on scarce natural resources will be too much and that stevia would become extinct. And so this has now been transformed into a biological production process, which means that it can meet some, some fairly high global demand without using up the natural resources that we need, that we take for granted uh, in you know, places like South America. So it gives you a really great example of how we can learn from nature and then work without depleting finite resources. So it, it makes me happy every day when I hear examples about this. So let's look at our next small company who's busy changing the world. And I'd really like to introduce fresh from Madrid airport, uh, Taichi Oshi, who is from EV Biotech. And so Taichi, do you want to unmute yourself and introduce the amazing work from EV Biotech? Hello all, uh, thank you for uh, listening in to me from, uh, yeah, I'm in Madrid currently, so I apologize if there are some uh, noises from Madrid, but, uh, and I would like to say, Cyril, thank you very much for the very illuminating talk. Uh, interestingly, EV Biotech does fall within the similar line of how can we use synthetic biology to create these new, uh, more sustainable ingredients. But maybe I'd like to go a bit more of like my journey as someone who didn't go into, uh, you know, chemistry and came into this from a very different perspective of someone who was very focused on pharmacology and molecular genetics. Um, and my reason, so this quote of the biggest innovations of the 21st century will be the intersection of biology and technology. Um, yeah, a new era is beginning. Uh, this is by Steve Jobs. Um, and for me, my background prior to EV uh, was very much working on next generation sequencing. And this is where I saw uh, high throughput strain characterization, high throughput sequencing. So uh, similar to what Abolus is looking, rather than trying to say, okay, we're going to try to screen every single thousands and thousands of these potential different strains to see whether these mutations might make a change in helping produce a product. And I would be sitting in these R&D meetings and be wondering, okay, this is great. This is a six, seven figure budget we're doing on an annual. But at the end of the year, I would always say, okay, did you get the product that you wanted? And the final question was, well, no, but we have a lot of data to work with. And for me, I just thought that was a very unsustainable way of looking at business, looking at way to transition to a more green circular economy when all you are doing is just trying to generate data for the sake of generating data rather than, okay, let's use it as a catalyst to improve our product development. So for me, um, joining EV Biotech was indeed the, the revolutionary step of, okay, how can we streamline this process? And indeed it's more of, can we use, uh, can we use the, what we already understand in the microorganisms and try to model that into an in silico design and not only just do it in in silico design, but also validate that within the actual testing of the wet lab. So the microorganisms as uh, Avolus is already very, kindly highlighted, has the potential to grow quite a lot of uh, different types of uh, ingredients, chemicals, and has already been, uh, I think that's a perfect example, found in the pharmaceutical industry to be able to say, we can characterize this to optimize strain development. But indeed, how is this being done is also a next question. You also have a lot of bottlenecks with people questioning, okay, are models actually going to be correct? Um, but I think this is one thing I would say is a nice value proposition of what EV Biotech offers and of course why I've been trying to work and trying to help facilitate this when it comes to client discussions is it's the nice synergistic approach of, of course, a model is only half the painting. 
being able to say that, okay, we are able to make these uh, different types of yeast E. coli digitally doesn't mean that we're able to be able to validate it, but then play, uh, using a holistic approach to saying we're going to first narrow down these thousands and thousands of potential strains. Uh, of course, incorporating the, all the information to say that some of these pathways or like the ways that uh, the chemicals uh, are being produced are going to be blocked by patents or so it limits what we're able to do. But then being able to streamline that process and then being able to define, okay, what's the actual ones we want to test in the lab? And of course, um, how do we do this is, well, first we have to show it to our potential clientele and of course always our investors that we can do this. And within the proof of concept strains, we've been able to indeed showcase that we have been able to, oh, sorry, I'll pause a bit. Well, maybe you don't want to hear the people taking a flight right now, but anywho, um, just being able to showcase that, hey, what we're just talking about isn't rocket science. It's not something that's going to come five, 10 years in the future. The future for synthetic biology is now, and we're able to do that with the strains that we have developed. So we've been able to produce uh, some of these proof of concept strains and, and show that there is a good balance between not only just purely using modeling to define which strains are available, but then also facilitating the streamlining in strain engineering to say how can we move forward with this development. So that is indeed what we do at EV Biotech. I, I feel as a younger company, we're still uh, only three years old. Uh, we have some a lot to grow into and a lot to learn, especially from uh, what we consider our, our elders, uh, which is Abolis. But indeed, it's always a very interesting journey as then you have different flavors. Um, as we are based in the Netherlands, we have a lot more different uh, industries, I would find. Uh, I, if you look at the Dutch um, industrial market, you have a lot of companies that are very much focused on the agri-food tech and then indeed trying to unravel the bottleneck of can we try to define uh, using microorganisms to make these new molecules. And of course, this is where we have seen to found our niche and looking to grow within uh, the specific area. Yeah, so indeed our platform is very much a synergistic approach as outlined earlier of trying to combine our in silico design. We also do have fermentators and then we do scale up up to pilot, but this is of course with collaborators as science, um, even though there's always usually one person winning the Nobel Prize, it is usually a combination of hundreds and hundreds of researchers. And in this case, we have our collaborators that we partner with to help facilitate the development of such strains and of course the final chemical products that we are interested in. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about us. Um, and then yeah, of course, we are currently moving at the intersection of biology and technology. And of course, uh, looking to move forward with trying to help facilitate a more circular and sustainable economy. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much indeed, Taji, and let, um, thank you for letting us come into Madrid Airport with you. You're living our dreams for us at the moment. So I think you make some really good points, and especially when you brought up um, being in the Netherlands, because of course the Netherlands, I think, is the world's second largest food producer, which sounds pretty crazy for a small country, but they are a huge hub for ingredients production and movement. And so when you look at the number of those ingredients that could be switched, from you know, original biological production into microbial production, that's a huge transition. And while we look at Europe, you know, Europe sets itself very high targets, but we also have to remember that we're one of the world's largest importers from products that would come from rainforests. So while we might be cleaning up our own act inside Europe, we, we need to address how we fit in the world as well and the resources that we take away from other regions. So it's kind of a dream that I have to say, wouldn't it be great if 50% of the, in, the animal feed that we import from South America, wouldn't it be great if we could produce that ourselves in a circular bioeconomy fashion inside Europe with a, you know, a carbon neutral, zero waste approach? This, would, this for me is where Europe needs to, to aim for. So it's both competitive and reducing the burden on um, natural resources. But I'm going to introduce you to our third speaker now, Juan, who brings a completely different aspect to it, who was founded the amazing Cafe Bueno company some time ago in Denmark, based on a product that we all take for granted in our lives and realize that we don't use it enough and we waste half the stuff that we have. So I'm going to take it hand over to Juan and he can tell us the, the secret of his company. 
Hitler. Um, yes, as you said, in Café Bueno, um, we believe that uh, yeah, coffee is the most underutilized resource on earth and uh, that's exactly what we're trying to change we want to change the way that people perceive coffee exactly from a beverage to a bio-based resource that could use could be used in infinite amount of ways to contribute as well in our own way uh, to this transition to a more bio-based and sustainable society so yeah thank you my name is juan medina i'm the ceo of cafuena as claire mentioned uh, our, what we do is that we upcycle, spend coffee grounds into ingredients uh, for function of foods, cosmetics, or nutraceuticals. So this is what, as Claire mentioned, what we have traditionally uh, see coffee as, as a beverage, uh, to make it maybe to the end of the day, to get a little bit energized. And as we said, the coffee has this curse, if we, if we want to call it a curse, that has been so good and popular in this years that we have totally forgotten that it's actually a seed, a plant, and all the things that come uh, beyond, uh, behind it. In Café Bueno, we take it from a different perspective, and uh, what we are trying to do is to try to enlighten the different ways that we can not only use the coffee, but most importantly, the compounds and the molecules that make up the coffee. So you may ask where all these come from. I'm originally from Colombia, and as you probably know, Colombia is a very big coffee country. Coffee is part of a culture, it's the biggest crop as well from an economic point of view. So it's pretty important and everyone, almost everyone, a lot of people have some kind of relations with coffee farms, coffee farming or something around. And that makes us, as usually it happens, all the good stuff, let's say it's always exported, but we are left, let's say, not with the bad stuff, but we are also, um, we are kind of forced as well due to the huge availability to not only use it as a beverage, but we have been using it for makeup, from uh, traditional medicines, for cosmetics, in foods, in, I mean, it's way more than only a beverage. For example, uh, when you are little in Colombia, my grandma told me uh, one, uh, many times when I had a wand to put coffee grounds in my wand after got a, after I had like a, a wand after playing football or any sport. And I mean, when we kind of it works, it has some wound healing properties that get accelerated and also antimicrobial, which prevent any kind of, uh, if the grounds are sterile, uh, prevent further um, contamination. Um, so yeah, this is kind of uh, how it goes, and this is because, and when we started Café Bueno was basically kind of, let's say, to reverse engineering that, and this is uh, exactly what we did, so we started finding out what is that makes coffee so good for actually for our health, and we started all this research and development not only into the applications, but the best way and most sustainable the way that we could break down coffee into its phenols, lipids, proteins, and sugars. At the same time, we were not only seeing the opportunity that the health benefits that coffee has around that it could provide a, a, to society, but also that it's also one of the most wasteful products on earth. Coffee travels all the way from Colombia, Vietnam, and different coffee producing countries in the world to Europe and travels more than 10,000 kilometers to only use 1%, which obviously is something very resource inefficient and that doesn't make any sense when we look at it. So instead of decreasing the coffee consumption, because I don't think that is probably the answer, the answer is using much better what we already have. There's no need to plan more. There's no, it's just giving a better use to what we have. So our solution is to develop a coffee biorefinery that is currently in the making and hopefully if everything goes on plan, we'll be up and running by the end of 2023. And uh, here we fractionate the coffee, we break it down into its own compounds through our proprietary process, and then we either uh, use uh, biocatalysis, fermentation, or green chemistry to make it into other higher value ingredients, or we sell them directly as they are. So until now, uh, last year we upcycled 12 tons of coffee waste. This year we're going to do 40,000 on the way. Uh, we are currently eight people. We have raised around 1.8 billion euros in private and soft funding, and we have currently two products in the market. 
with a couple of more coming in the next year. Our first product in the market is our Café Bueno Oil, which we have focused mostly on the cosmetic applications. We have done different in vivo and in vitro studies where we have found and proved the anti-aging and some protection properties that this oil has uh, we, uh, for human skin. And we currently are uh, commercializing it with our partner, Yugodan. Here it's also some of the market with some of different brands uh, in UK, in the US, in Europe, and also market leading Nivea, which is already testing our product in, in the German market and uh, next year also in other European countries. This is our oil, a more in confectionery. Well, the oil after we do some refinement and modifications can be a nice emulsifier and preservative for confectionery. As you can see here, it's also being used in the UK mostly right now for this application. Also here is in bakery. Here we can extend way more than it is uh, the shelf life of the products and also it has a, it improves the elasticity of the flower. Our second product is our fiber, which we are using it, yeah, from bakery to exfoliant to cosmetic applications. And here is also in the market. We have done pizza, confectionery. I think sometimes it's very important that people actually see where we do it because, yeah, I mean, it's still, this is what we do every day to try to exemplify and show that coffee is not only a beverage. So in rye bread here in Denmark, it has become very popular because it's a very, one, relatively a way to save costs. It's a multifunctional ingredient, it's gluten-free, and rye bread is the most popular bread in Denmark by far, so it has been a very, very good reception. And of course, we have several more ingredients in the pipeline. We're launching some new ingredients this year to work cosmetic applications. We have some very, very interesting products coming on, and certainly the best is yet to come. This is our team. We also have a very solid team of advisors from the ingredients in general industry. And yeah, we're probably going to end the year around eight to 10 people. So to end up a little bit and to recap, coffee is not a beverage, it's not waste. It's the most underutilized resource on earth. And we're only using 1% of this beautiful crop that we have. And that's also why farmers are paid so low, because actually they pay only to use that 1%. So Hopefully, with Café Bueno, we can help to meet these climate goals by using coffee, help prevent and treat health conditions of society, phase out petrochemicals and synthetics from our day-to-day -day products, help our suppliers to convert overheads into revenue streams, create jobs and increase tax revenue from all these new products and new products into circularization. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Brian. And that was a really, really nice example to bring where you can actually see the products. And it is amazing when you think about how we use coffee. It is the ultimate single use food. We don't even eat it. We just expose it to water for a really short period of time and then throw it away. So it's crazy that we use such a tiny percentage of the energy that has gone into this, as you say, the magic bean. Um, so we're really looking forward to you know, understanding more how you grow and the kind of market demand that you see for this, because this is the kind of ingredient where it's easy to explain what you've done and it's easy to create consumer demand. And that drives large companies looking at what you do as well. So um, I've already got a few very active questioners in there. So I think we should get to those questions first and then come back to the questions that we thought up ourselves earlier. So Lyra was very inspired by Cafe Bueno's talk to say, what are the starting compounds that could be used in the production systems for EV, EV Biotech and um, Abilis? You know, can, is there a current or future plan to introduce sort of waste materials into your production? And I know before, before we answer that, we know that from a biofuel production perspective, there's been 20, 30 years of work in Europe in particular to look at how you use the non-food part of crops as an energy source for microbial production systems. But I think you know, circular can mean more than just energy sources. So I'll ask perhaps Sikhaili first um, about what you feed into your systems that may already be deemed waste. Um, 
So there's always a question when you think of a biomass source and the source of uh, the carbon that you want to transform, um, which is going to be, uh, what's going to be the impact of the raw material that you use as a carbon source in the final product. So you could use a cheaper source of carbon, but it will leave leftovers um, that have to pay a high price to purify from the ingredients that you are making. Um, and uh, um, the, the, the most traditional biomass that we use, frankly, uh, for yeast extract, bakeries, and so on, is, uh, is molasses. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, this is what we target as a raw material for most of our product. And this, the second problem would be, well, the second generation sugar are not yet on the market, but they, they definitely represent a hope um, for for carbon source. Uh, as as far as the coffee, the coffee is concerned, it's very good that we reuse uh, what is left over of coffee, but this is not a local biomass. So um, I, I'd rather not consider that as a sustainable way of doing chemistry. It is very good that we recycle and we extract more compounds and we make more of the coffee that we have. But shall we use it as a carbon source? No, I, that's not my um, that's not my vision. Very good point. And I know that as this is a fairly young set of technologies as well, a lot of the regulatory the regulatory requirements will, will make you use high grade inputs into such products and processes because they want to be absolutely sure of what's coming out. I think this may change as the technology matures and becomes more, you know, as more data becomes available about the production processes. But at the moment, it's almost like a medical supply chain in terms of the level of the grade of material that is required for the thing. I don't know if you want to add to that, Tai Chi. Uh, no, indeed. I, I think, yeah. You've got it right on the dots, but maybe just, I guess, for the Netherlands, you've already highlighted that we do produce quite a lot of agriculture. We are the second largest agriculture exporters in the world. So uh, for us, we have, uh, there's a few cooperatives that we do work with that we are seeing that can we use it as, as you highlight the question highlighted waste sources, but indeed try to keep things um, that are being produced in the Netherlands. And can we use sources, uh, waste sources from the Netherlands to be able to produce it? And then, of course, how does that also impact when we make these uh, life cycle assessments, if you will, of saying, OK, are we actually being sustainable? And actually, are we able to say that we are greener in producing a final compound because everything is more local and there's less uh, CO2 output being produced because you don't have to export things from other countries? Yeah, that's a, that's a super interesting point. And I'm always very interested in life cycle analyses to look at what can be changed and what what global distance make what difference that makes to the cut to the overall footprint of the product that you are producing so yeah it's a really super interesting and we have a question that's also suitable for Kwan as well with climate change affecting plant production you know particularly coffee production you know do you think this may be a problem for access to raw materials in the future or would you are you looking into other product or side products from um, from food as well um, I mean, there are a couple of sides uh, to that question. Uh, I think I have seen around, and I, 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 there, there are several reports where it says that in general, the amount of food waste that we have already, so I, one third almost of the food is produced is going to waste. So I think with already what we have one, we can cover even the amount of kids and people that are hungry all around the world. And one, two, either we can confirm, uh, convert them to second generation sugars in general. And then is, of course, I think, and the beauty of synthetic biology and all these new technologies are there that eventually they should be able to develop some hopes that could adapt to these mixed substrates. And that is what eventually will become this really sustainable. And again, of course, that is the challenge, but that's where the opportunity, I think, it is from a sustainability point of view, of course. From an economical perspective, it makes it harder, but from a sustainability that let's say that is the holy grail to say that way to take a mix of it and then do whatever you want with it. Of course, it's it's a, a bit difficult. In the issue with coffee and in general, I think with all monocrops and let's say industrialized crops, I don't think the problem too much is the crops. It's rather the system that has forced these farmers to do this in those large scales, which become unsustainable. 
because, for example, in the case of Colombia, and in coffee in general, 80 to 85 percent of the uh, farmers of coffee that are smallholder farmers who actually are pretty sustainable in their practices. Many times they are regenerative and biodynamic and all these different things that they are shade. So, for example, if you go in Colombia in almost all the regions, it's grown next to cocoa, banana, mango. I mean, there are different there are different shade uh, coffee areas uh, to say it that way. So I think, uh, of course, climate change will affect most probably uh, not only coffee production, but we're seeing it all over. I mean, in everything from energy to coffee to air, it's it's a it's a it's a global issue uh, to say it that way. So of course, I think it will be uh, it will affect, and that's why it's so important to use what we already have. That's the point of all of this. Is not there's no need to produce more. There's a, it's just giving a better use to what we have to say that way. And for now, I mean, we are sticking to coffee. There's last year 10 billion kilograms were consumed and none of this was really recycled. So I think there's a lot to get around still. Um, and yeah, and we are happy. We believe that there's an immense potential in coffee and at least for the near future, we're sticking with it. Um, it's such a complex material that you know, you've only just scratched the surface of what you could use the extracts for, I think. And even what, even after you found one application, it then opens the door to many other applications using the same characteristic that you have discovered. So I think, yeah, and it, it's always really interesting because people have a very romanticized image often of food production around the world. You know, when you talk about coffee and tea, and we will probably all drink it in this webinar. But these are huge monocrops, you know, and have been huge for a really long time. You know, we think about palm oil as like the bad guy in the room, but that's a relatively recent massive monocrop. So, you know, when things are popular, they will get grown in enormous quantities, and that can substantially change the environment in which they are grown, often not for the better. But let's go back to one or two of the questions that we had between ourselves here, because from a sustainability perspective, I wanted to ask Cyril and Tai Chi how you actually prove to partners that what you're doing to transform their manufacturing processes is more sustainable. What facts and figures do you provide them with shows their reduced environmental footprint by changing the production process for even this, like for the same compound as they already produce you know, using a traditional chemicals approach? So let's go back to Cyril and say, you know, how do you how do you prove what you do is good? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, there are several slides to this question. Uh, the first, uh, the first thing that we look at, especially in cosmetic uh, and certain industry, is the origin of the atom. Okay, and then the LCA, the life cycle assessment, comes as a second. Um, so the origin of the atom uh, is already a part of the of a part of the question. Uh, is that where do we take our carbon source from and uh, and um, how much or how less uh, solvents and petrochemical and, and uh, expensive manufacturing facility um, um, we we stop using when we use uh, industrial biotechnologies. Second aspect of the question is where do we produce? Um, uh, like one of the motivation is to reshore um, production in Europe. So, um, so there, there's also an impact on this reshoring and on the fact that we operate in an environmental, um, in an environment that we control um, and we control more the impact of the chemistry or the biochemistry um, that we're doing here than we control the impact on the environment in China, India uh, and others. Um, then if you look, if you want to go for the complete life cycle assessment for now we we haven't uh, been in the situation where we could make a difference uh, because most of the product that we compare ourselves from are extracted products so um, it's different uh, what you consider in the farming if you could farm this uh, this plant originally or what you would you consider uh, in the uh, um, in the sustainability of the plant extract that you are working on. That's one aspect. Um, and uh, But we are now working on uh, on chemicals that are made through petrochemistry and that we are doing in cell. 
Um, so the, the most uh, important question to our customer now is, um, is it bio-based and could it be made in Europe? And how do we control the chemical environment? So those are the three questions that I said earlier, but we haven't came to the point to do a complete life cycle assessment for these products. Uh, this is definitely something we shall do for the future. For small scale ingredients, like several tons, if you, it, it is not so much of the question, but when you start speaking of kilotons, um, then it is definitely need to be assessed. And sometimes you get surprised. Huh? If, you, if you produce uh, fatty acid um, by fermentation, you will never have the same yield than palm oil and the same price than palm oil. But uh, LCA, life cycle assessment, do not consider all the externalities that palm oil is doing to the environment. I've been to Malaysia. This is absolutely awful what they are doing to their environment. So um, life cycle assessment cannot take the entire problem. And we shall we shall look at it through different prisms. I think that's a really good answer because because I think it's the same with sort of oversupply of fish stock and stuff like that. That often you're not measuring the origins, the impact of the origins. And we know that in our anniversary program, we've seen some really nice examples of how production systems can change. So again, around the vitamin B2 production not only did it reduce the amount of energy um, and waste associated with the production process, but it also prevented, it eliminate, eliminated the use of various types of solvent in the production as well. And use of those not only themselves come from quite an environmentally heavy uh, production pathway, but their disposal also has a big cost as well. So the more you, things you can take like that out of the system, the better, the more sustainable the overall product actually is. And it will be really interesting to see how life cycle analyses and procurement requirements make a difference to how people view the value points in the in their production supply chain. But Tai Chi, did you want to add as well how uh, how EU Biotech starts to sell its you know, environmental credentials? Indeed, actually, we did produce a life cycle assessment from one of our proof of concept strains for the terpene, and we did see that there was a uh, a quarter of decrease in producing a specific terpene geranium um, in comparison to trying to get the field. So this is something that we have been looking to incorporate. Um, and I, I think maybe just one thing to maybe step away a bit from the sustainability, um, but also looking at it from a business point of view, sometimes it's very hard to justify, I would say, from a company perspective, uh, from a, a larger company, I mean, if they want to translate to a more sustainable method, but then if the, the product price is going to be quadruple or five times as high, they see it, they, they see the value, it's sustainable, yes, it's green, natural, if you will, but then for them, it's also, they're trying to sell their product, and if it's going to eat into their, you know, product, uh, the margins that they're making, they also have to make that very rational decision of, okay, it's nice that we can make it sustainable. It's, we've done these life cycle assessments, but actually it's, we're going to lose money if we do this. And I, I think that's also some of the bottlenecks uh, I've seen when we're doing these t uh, technical economic analysis that you are showing that, okay, you can make this sustainably in microorganisms, but the price is still too high that you can't move forward with it. And it's like, oh, this is nice. Maybe in five years time, we can find some other way, but it's still, that's another bottleneck to help the, yeah. The convincing or more of seeing they still see the, the the capital value of can we make money off of it or at least get a, a similar price that we can make it synthetically and that's still i find a, a bottleneck moving forward to making it more sustainable process that's a good point and we can bring in a direct example from the pharmaceutical sector in here because people don't think about sustainable production and pharmaceuticals per se but of course, pharmaceuticals have got a very complex supply chain. You know, as we've seen with vaccine manufacture, there's lots of different components that go into a final pharmaceutical product. And a lot of the technologies behind that are sort of old school production systems that were developed 40 years ago and offshored to really cheap places. And if they want to become more sustainable, it's going to make the cost higher. And in pharmaceuticals in the healthcare sector, particularly in Europe, where it's public procurement and very, very price driven. It's not that the companies will make less money. They will simply cease to be able to sell their products because they are not going to win a single tender to supply a particular medicine. So it's it takes changes throughout the whole process. It takes policy changes and it particularly takes changes around procurement 
um, criteria. So if you're going on a price only basis for procurement, you cannot shift away from really cheap production systems because, because nobody is going to buy pay more, more expensively. And Europe is looking at that right now to try and build diversity into the procurement side of things and try to place a value on the environmental footprint of the products that they are purchasing. But let's go back to Juan and talking about um, coffee. I mean, I wanted to ask, you know, we see a lot of greenwashing coming out from big corporate brands. How do you, how do we get past that? And how does Europe make sure that it doesn't fall into the terrible trap of just saying nice words in headlines, but actually not being more sustainable? I mean, it's a bit to add a little bit to what you were saying before. I, of course, let's say uh, everyone wants to pay the least amount of things for something, but I think that is a, a bit of an old school way of thinking from 30, 50 years ago, industrialization came and everything has to be the cheapest price possible. Now we're actually, let's say, paying the price for that cheap prices and procurement and manufacturing that we have driven down to those prices to meet that demand. So I think it's more about uh, that, as you mentioned, there has to be some policy changes. Uh, I think these new requirements these new standards uh, that, for example, I've seen this this last week or this week that the cosmetic like L'Oreal and some Unilever and in general some big corporates, they they want now to put something on the label like a green, yellow kind of uh, some kind of let's say uh, yeah some kind of way to demonstrate the consumers that this product is actually maybe more sustainable less whatever but there has to be some kind of benchmarking if not it's just as you mentioned just maybe i've been watching maybe not but it wouldn't it's impossible to prove it so i think there has to be some kind of yeah some kind of labeling that shows and educate consumers what they are buying at the end of the day it's their choice but at least they have all the information available to make that choice and i think again as Tarich mentioned of course price is important in this but eventually i think in maybe five years from now of course right right now i think we're starting that way so i think eventually it will become the normal as it comes and we reach price parity if things don't go very insane on the raw material price but in general um, i mean there will still be rewashing i mean people that's uh, people people i mean you know people are sneaky sometimes and they just i mean that's marketing at the end of the day yeah. it's uh, really about selling I and mean, if that helps them sell unfortunately that's that's what they do. So I think it's more important on the manufacturers and the ingredient suppliers, at least in our case, uh, to keep integrity and be ethical. I mean, that is something that you and, of course, this gen should be a bit more supported from a policy point of view, because at the end of the day, it's impossible really to control without any support from, from governments around the world. Well, has followed up with an interesting question as well, and he's oh, which pushes all my wrong buttons um, when it says, would you consider the EU organic label to be sufficient, or do we need a separate label focusing on sustainability? As I'm going to say, I'm going to put it out there, organic doesn't, it does not imply sustainability so, yeah. whatsoever when you look at the science. I would be super happy to see a, you know, a well-applied sustainability label. Because I think you'd be surprised at the number of things that did not fit a sustainability label that already sell themselves as sustainable. But uh, that's a conversation for another day because it makes me super cross all the time. <laughs> so I want to I want to go back to the microbial engineering as well to look at where the business side of this is. So, okay, in microbial engineering, is it primarily small companies moving into this space as innovators? Or are the large companies really getting going on this as well? You know, perhaps you think about the large BSF type companies that are already in manufacturing space. Which, what, what are companies doing at all, all scales? Okay, so there are uh, many startups which are not as well, which are SMEs now, um, which are historically start playing in the field, uh, mostly in the US. Uh, with Ameris, Genomatica, um, 
and others, uh, but also in Europe with Metabolic Explorer, Global Bioenergies, uh, and so on. So these are the most well known, I would say. Um, but inside some major chemical groups, they were biotechnology team. Uh, they are biotechnology team, which sometimes are huge, um, which are working on these problems. Um, so historically, there was uh, Dupont, uh, who was doing the PDO internally. Uh, you have Evonik, which has made a couple of surfactants which are on the market. And if you look at the size of this company uh, and, and the size of the team that work on metabolic engineering, it is huge. It is sometimes bigger than uh, in the biggest startup. Um, as we know, um, if you look, for instance, like with the, there is a three band uh, game between uh, Monsanto, BASF and, uh, and Bayer. And now BASF has an industrial biotechnology team of 2000 people, 2000 people. That's, that's huge. Evonik is also a few hundred people. Cargill is, is a high number of uh, biotech. You have the merger between uh, Dupont and Dupont Bioscience and IFF. So this is not a game for small companies anymore. Uh, this is a game for major players um, who can afford having large team. And it is a game for uh, middle players to partner with, uh, with biotech and we could provide like the externalized capacity, um, industry, uh, it externalized R&D, especially focused on that, so that they could acquire this technology and stay up in the game as well. No, I think that's really interesting to say, because you've just listed a lot of our own members there, which of course is a sort of humble brag here. But uh, it's really fascinating, because of course the large companies have a role, they can take long-term strategic decisions and invest over a longer period of time to achieve a really big scale up or a really big manufacturing conversion. Small companies don't have that, but they can really move very quickly with emerging technologies, whereas the larger companies are smaller to be able to develop and grow those emerging technologies. So it's very much the same as in you know, all high tech sectors, the small companies play a critical role and the large companies essentially amplify and stabilize a route to scale up into the market. So it's all incredible. They all have a really important role to play, particularly in Europe, which has such a deep innovation and R and D base. Um, it needs that pipeline to large scale production for sure. Okay, well we're coming towards the end of the webinar, and it has been incredibly easy, um, interesting already. Um, I was just looking at our other questions that we've got left. I mean, I've got a question for Juan as well. You are a small company, but you're dealing with some pretty big, you know, cosmetics producers and nutraceuticals producers and all things like that, and which are really big players. How do you get involved with companies like that and persuade them to take up your products and processes? I mean, uh, by offering a solution to a problem, uh, that they are having it's uh, usually, I don't know, sometimes uh, with brands and stuff like that, let's say with B2C directing companies, we see their products, we see their ingredient list, let's say we know what we have, and we come, okay, we have this, you can replace this, this, and this, and this, and you, we use it this way, and we usually, I mean, now that we have a little bit more of resources, before it was a bit harder, but now that we have a team actually doing formulations and a bit of product development in-house that we can come, let's say, with almost that solution to the customer to make it as easy as possible for them, that they, that makes it a lot easier than before that was trying to convince them that this could work, that I don't know, we come, this works this way. You can also try it out and change it a little bit, but it works to say it that way. So it's, it's, it's more about that. I think it's more about having very clear what you want that is very key i see many small companies uh, that sometimes uh, ask us for advice in this aspect and they don't know exactly what type of deal or what they want exactly and obviously that is not gonna go anywhere usually probably what is gonna happen they're gonna drain all your information that they have uh, and if you don't ask what you want they are not gonna give it to you because they might don't even know they could give you that to say it that way. So it's a matter of, I think, of having your priorities very clear to say it that way. So 
yeah. So acting as a big guy, but being a small guy at the same time. You're a great example of businessmen turned scientists later, whereas most a lot of small companies are scientists first, businessmen potentially never. Um, and I grew up in the sort of first wave of biotech SMEs growing um, in like in the early 2000s. And regardless of how good the science was, if you couldn't sell that science to anybody, then you weren't going to have a successful or growing company. So it was all about how you sell it. And so do you, I mean, the curse of a small company as well is a larger company goes, I like the look of that. I'll take 5,000 tons of it tomorrow, please. And I'd like 5,000 tons next week. How do you get past that uh, issue? Uh, I mean, what we have done until now is that we have been, of course, using a, a, a partner manufacturing with the, with the capabilities that if we run into that, we will be able to supply, maybe not in the as agile way that if we would have our own production. We have right now a production, but it's more a pilot sample type of thing, a couple of kilos, tens of kilos. But of course, as you mentioned, it comes a 5,000 ton order, then that would be, we could deliver it, but of course it would take a bit more time uh, to say it that way. And yeah, we're sacrificing some margins in that way, but the idea is that eventually until we meet since at the end of the day, our, our businesses, we need CapEx. We are trying to build that by refinery. We're building infrastructure. We at least need to have, I don't know, 50, 40, 60% of that sold before actually going into build. So the idea is, yeah, sacrificing some margins with the idea to scale up faster. But eventually, we need to produce in-house. And it's always nice, I think, also for customers, investors, and partners in general they like to come and see like all oh, this where it happens how it is and all of this so it's a it's a how do you say like a egg egg chicken situation that we have to try to play with it and dance around in the best way until we have our resources to fully do it but we are very much on the way and hopefully if everything goes well there will be a bio refiner here in copenhagen by the end of next year that's really good news. And yeah, this is really where, for me, Europe needs to focus on its manufacturing scale up is in those really high value niche product areas, because we're always going to get out competed on huge manufacturing supply um, and the cost that you can bring to you know, the economy of scale that you can bring. But from high value products, that's Europe's future, because it's exactly where the investment's going to be. So I would like to thank all of our speakers that has been a really really interesting webinar thank you very much indeed uh it has been recorded so we will share it with everybody and we would be delighted to follow up with anybody who has other questions so once again i'll say th a big thank you to Cyril, Peggy, and Juan and you can all go back to your everyday lives of airports and wherever you are and uh, i will see some of you next week in Vienna for our eFib conference which is incredibly exciting uh, to see everybody back together face to face. Um, and we look forward to following up with the really nice audience that we had today. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you soon.